I think I'm in boyhood heaven. Look what I found. Uh, where'd you get that from? I've been in your office, I hope you don't mind. You've been rooting around? I have. You? It's amazing. Aren't they sweet? I bought it, really, for one of my grandsons. Fabulous. But they're only four. And they'd smash it within minutes. But it's a real good, old-fashioned, mechanical German toy. Right. As it happens, I paid £100 for it. Did you make, and does, here... Does, that, does it work? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll show you. I'll wind it up. Oh, yeah, you've got the sort of farm equipment that, that goes with it. The complete set. This is a drill for seeds. Uh -huh. And rollers and Lord knows what, Fabulous. arrows and things. It's got a gearbox. Right. And it steers. Let's see if we can get it to go. Right. Ah, Look there at that. Is. is that fun? Brilliant. Isn't Absolutely that fun? Absolutely brilliant. Well, let's hope we can make more than £100. Uh, I'll call Jonty in. Jonty, come and have a look at this. What have you got there? Oh, wonderful track to hey, We're in the country. Well. Isn't that fabulous? <laughs> it looks absolutely brand spanking new. It, it is. Yeah. It is. Box oh, fresh. Got the box. Say. Freshly box boxed. Fresh. And you've got all the all those farming yeah. pieces of equipment as well. How much did you pay for it, Nick? A hundred. A hundred quid. It's quite toppy, wasn't it? Okay. Essentially what we're looking at here is the very early tractors from the 1930s. So this is the maker Fend, mm -hmm. um, but on the side here, let's have a look on the side here, we've got a picture of a horse. And the make of this tractor is the Diesel Ross, which, is, which means diesel horse in oh, German. Yeah, okay. And that was the name that was first given to these very early tractors in Germany. Mm -hmm. This is definitely worth putting in the auction sale. Um, hundred pounds, no. That's retail, isn't it? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, really? Well, Nick, it probably wasn't your shrewdest investment. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I accept that uh, it won't make the hundred. Hmm. Um, well, I think at auction, if we put 40 to 60 pounds on it... For yeah. everything? Uh, yes, then I think we should be uh, attracting quite a big market there. 40 to 60 pounds? Not bad. We should plough on. Yes, good. <laughs> plough on. <laughs> he went to school. You're, you're irresistible. He went to school oh, arrow, arrow, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. I've obviously spent too long in Jonty's company. Nick and Catherine continue digging out antiques, which have the potential to bring in plenty of charity cash. And in the kitchen, I take a look at some of their crockery. Could this hot plate be a hot find, I wonder? Nick remembers how it always lived in his parents' home and thinks it may have come from his great grandparents in Norfolk. Despite its age, it's not that valuable, getting just 10 to 20 pounds from our expert. Speaking of Jonty, there's a painting in urgent need of appraisal. Tell me more. Well, it's a very odd picture and a very odd story. It was painted by the, uh, the wife of the late ruler of uh, Dubai, Sheikh Maktoum, for a charity auction. And what's extraordinary is that all of these stones, the uh, turquoise and the opals and the emeralds and indeed the diamonds right, signify various things. Alan Sugar, as he then was, very kindly, because it was for charity, lent us an enormous apartment he had in London, which was empty, for an art gallery. And this was the pièce de résistance. It was uh, auctioned. It fetched, I think, only £9,000, which was something of a surprise. Okay, And um, rather mysteriously, uh, her Highness bought it back and gave it to Alan Sugar as a thank you. And clearly it didn't appeal to his uh, taste, and he gave it to me. <laughs> and I whipped it down to Hatton Garden on the off chance that I could make a, a, a necklace of the uh, diamonds or earrings or something for Catherine. So what do they value the stones at? The chap in Hatton Garden said, um, the stones are of bad, poor value, probably <laughs> worth about £1,000. He said, but I wouldn't give you a thousand pounds for them. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, here is an invitation to the, uh, the charity exhibition. There's our picture. Oh, yeah. And there's the artist, Sheikha Bushra. Lovely woman, a charming woman, a bad painter. <laughs> well, I have to say, I agree with you somewhat. The oil that seems to have been on the canvas there seems to be applied really by squeezing the tube and laying it very thickly across the canvas. And the problem is that if you were to take this along to the auction sale, the dealers themselves, they, they can't do what you have done and taken it along to a jeweller to have the stones assessed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And therefore, I can't even put a thousand pounds on the picture for yeah. you. 
at auction, we're looking at between two and four hundred pounds only. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you know, it's entirely up to you whether you put this into the auction set. Extraordinary. So should we leave that there for there the moment? There we are. Let's have a think about it. Good idea. Lord Sugar gave this painting to Nick some years ago. If he does decide to put it up for auction, it'll be sold along with everything else we found today in aid of a good cause. I know how close this one is to Nick's heart. It's a small charity doing big work. It's called Hope and Homes for Children. Initially, they started in uh, Eastern Europe, in Romania, where I saw them at work. They're also in Moldova and the Ukraine. They're now in Africa, and in fact, I'm going down to Sierra Leone later in the summer. Uh, I saw their work in Rwanda uh, last summer. It's essentially ensuring that every child has the right to be brought up in a family environment. In Eastern Europe, particularly in Romania during Ceausescu's regime, children were taken from their parents because the state considered perhaps that they weren't capable of looking after them because they hadn't got enough money or whatever it was, and they'd pop them into a warehouse, a child warehouse, and the charity its function was to close these institutions down and take those kids, reunite them with their families, or, if there were no families for whatever reason, put them into small households, maybe 12 children with a couple of mamas, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, where they could grow and develop. In Africa, it's a different issue. Down in Rwanda, where they, they are orphans, and they take those orphans, they ensure they're looked after, but where appropriate, they will give that orphan a little bit of money to enable them to start their own business and therefore fend for themselves. And I saw 12 and 14 year old kids running their own businesses in the markets, which enable them to feed themselves and clothe themselves and the charity and the local authority there would ensure that they grew up safely. Incredible. Uh, children obviously mean uh, a lot to you. Uh, are you hoping that your grandchildren uh, will follow you into business? Um, well, I hope they'll do whatever makes them happy and, and, and gives them a rewarding life. They're four years old and two years old, so I think it's a little bit uh, early to, to say. I haven't seen any signs of, um, of uh, entrepreneurship yet, although really? two of them um, spend most of their time telling me they're firemen. Well, if we need to help your charity, then I think we should uh, carry on hunting for the treasures. Come on. Good. Let's go. Off to you. Thank you. Nick and Catherine's home has proved to be full of interesting curios, and they keep on coming. On the landing, Catherine investigates a display cabinet and decides this Japanese tea set could go towards the charity fund. It's from Nick's parents' home in Wiltshire, and he thinks his uncle Joe, who fought in Burma, could have picked it up in a Japanese tea house during the war. It gets a 40 to 60 pounds estimate. And Nick's found an intriguing case. So where's Jonty? Well, he's with us in the lounge, and if we hang around him long enough, maybe we'll absorb some of his expertise. Osmosis, you know. He must be, have been only about... Now then. There. Oh, ah. here he comes. Uh -huh. What do you reckon about this, Nick? Don't tell them. Oh, I see, yes. Don't tell got... them. Uh, uh, OK. What do you reckon that might be? I haven't got a clue. I think I've seen one of those before. Is there anything you haven't seen? <laughs> well, this is a very unusual thing. You don't see too many of these. But am I right that this is a, a timepiece for racing pigeons? That's my belief. <laughs> yeah. I've no idea how it works. Get out of this. I just, <laughs> that. No, 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 I just like the, the mechanics of it. Yes. But, yeah, that's exactly what it is. Nick, can I ask you a million-dollar question? Why have you got this? <laughs> I just like it. OK. Mm. I just like it. So where'd you pick You'll it up explain. From? I bought it, I think, down in uh, one of these um, car boot sales right. sitting at the back. I mean, not too many people are looking for that sort of thing. No, that's very true. Um, uh, so was the owner that was selling it, and did they know exactly what it was as well? They told me what it was. Oh, they did. Okay. <laughs> All right. But they didn't know how it worked either. Right. So you're going to tell us how it Well, works. I've never seen this in operation, so right. I'm just assuming that this is how it works, because on the inside, let's open it up first of all, it's got this amazing clockwork mechanism. That's wow. what I love about it. Yes. We have a series of hoops. I am assuming that you put the ring of the pigeon through this hole here. And once those rings go into this machine, that is the time that your pigeon has taken to get from one place to the other. You don't push the pigeon's foot down in there, do you? You might well do, but I, can't, I'm not, I don't know. <laughs> I've never seen this in operation. Because we have a clock, a timer, on the front there. And it's locked here against fraudsters. That's right. You've got your lock on the front there, like yeah. so. Yeah. So that's how I assume that it works, but um, I'm happy to be told otherwise. <laughs> Are you, you willing to give this away then? Yeah. 
Yes, I am. What did you pay for it? Yes, I am. Uh, not so much, about £15, I think. £15? Yeah, okay. a while ago. Was it a um, sound investment for Nick? <laughs> I don't, it depends whether you can find anybody, A, who's got pigeons, yeah. or secondly, who likes clockwork things. Well, I think, um, I think it's been a good investment, because at auction we're looking at between £20 and £40. Pounds. So, hey, a triple your investment, that yeah. would be very nice indeed. Yeah. Excellent. Guys, all I can tell you is that our day of rummaging has come to an end. That's it? That's it. We've got all our items. Well um, done. It's been very, very successful. You're after 400 quid for your charity. Um, I can tell you that if we take Jonty's lowest estimates on all of the items that we've uh, accumulated, um, if we don't include the painting, which you're not sure about at the moment, mm, yeah. um, you've got 400 quid. All if right. you include the painting, then we're looking at sort of something like 600 pounds. Okay. Let's okay. see how we go. Okay. Great. It's been yeah, fun. Yeah. Yes. Have you enjoyed it? I've, I've loved it. I, I've loved learning so much about pigeons. It's been fascinating. It really has. And what we're going to do is we'll go through their pockets for yeah. the silver spoon. Yeah. <laughs> oh, really? Oops. We'll see you at the auction. Yeah. Okay. Good.